First thing I want to do is apologize. I got uh, a bit overwhelmed with the last couple of weeks with some stuff that was going on for me at home, and uh, I think I got it under control. But I, I know I'm a little bit behind on those lectures that I should have posted. So uh, I will get those done today. So you'll have everything that was for today. We're, we're going to go over it, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work through it. But we'll, uh, uh, I'll get a, I'll get those posted. Um, also, we have, this is the second to last week, and next week is the last week. So what I would like to do is meet both of the Fridays. I'll record them, right? I don't take attendance on Friday. My goal for this Friday is to finish whatever we don't get to today, um, and then start talking about the old exam that I posted on the, web, on the uh, Blackboard site. So we can start doing some exam pro. And then um, uh, for next week, we'll finish up the materials in the last chapter. And then on the following Friday, so a week from Friday, um, we'll do a little bit of a review. The exam is December 3rd. It's a Tuesday. And if I'm right, it starts at 9? Yeah. That sounds right, doesn't it? OK. So uh, those of you who are taking it on exam 4, it is a, uh, you will be locked out from your computers. But you are, it's open code. So you're allowed to bring your code in with you. All right? So it's Closed access, no internet, no whatever, but you can bring your book in, and I'm not going to check if you annotated it. I'm not going to check because I won't be here. I will be in China teaching uh, a course at a university in China for the first two weeks of December. So, um, but we're ending our last class is next week, and then there's a week after that where there's still some classes. So, what I would like to do is have an additional review session. So, we'll meet a week from Friday to do some review, and then have one more time when we can get together after classes are over. Probably on a Thursday or Friday, I'll check with the LRC to see if those rooms are available, and I'll uh, schedule that. So um, I'm not leaving until November 30th, so you're absolutely free to contact me, but hopefully we'll have enough, had enough chances to do for you to come to me and do review before I leave so that you'll feel like you're in a good place. So the first. This Friday, I'd like to uh, review the exam that I posted on Blackboard. I will then post an additional uh, additional questions that I have for you to review. Today, we're going to do the question that was from the multi-state exam, so we'll look at that as well. And uh, then next Friday, just sort of more of a general review, review, come with your questions about the class. So hopefully, after you've had a chance to do the multi-state exam that we had today, and then the old exam that we'll look at on Friday, that will raise issues for you, and you'll come the last Friday, a week from Friday, with questions uh, based on the material. And we can do a review, okay, in that exam. And then I will have an additional time where I'll be available probably in this room um, before, uh, before Thanksgiving. I don't think there are any exams in two weeks, but the week of Thanksgiving, I think there's two days of exams. So I won't do anything that time, but the Friday before, or the Thursday before, because classes will be over. I'll hold a review session. Okay? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, us have a PR final on Friday? Oh, that's right. Shoot, I forgot about that. I'm the dean on duty for that. Uh, so you won't be here. Um, I forgot all about that. That's right. Uh, well, let me come up with an alternative because you guys are also taking, are you taking the MPRE on Saturday too? Yeah. Okay, so that's that. There's no point in, in holding a, a review session if none of you are going to be here. So, um, well, maybe we can still do cram a lot. If if we need to catch up uh, next week, we will. But we will also do a review then, um, and uh, we'll have one more review. But let me see if I can't also. Maybe I'll have a. I'll, I'll put in an extra date then. So instead of one, we'll have two dates available. So I want you guys to have the time to come and talk to me and ask questions. I'll put more sample questions on the Blackboard site so that you can look at those and uh, work through them. I, I will say, I hope you notice, I forgot the, I don't think at the beginning of the semester I made much about it, but at the end of every chapter there are multiple choice questions that have the answers are in the book. So I would suggest that a really great way to review is to do those questions without looking at the answers, which I know is hard to do. 
So just start working through them. And that's a, gonna be a great review because that is the textbook author's um, uh, uh, review of the material that they think is critical. I also, for the most part, agree. There's only a few things I've skipped. Is that like a hint? Sorry? Is that like a hint? <laughs> Uh, it, yes, it's a huge hint. In other words, go ahead and do those and I think you will benefit from it. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, I'm not gonna test multiple choice, but so these are multiple choice questions, so it's not the, the form of question that I'm gonna ask, but it is the material that I'm gonna cover. And so I think if you can go through those multiple choice questions and do okay with them, you're probably in pretty good shape. Questions? The exam that you put online can be similar to the Yes, I, I had some short answer questions on that exam. I probably won't do that. I, am, I haven't finished it yet, so I don't know exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, I will, uh, obviously, before we go away, I'll have an opportunity to tell you exactly what the structure is. Um, the first short answer question was based on the old law. So the essay questions are perfect. They work great under the new law. The, the, the first question on, on that exam really was more written given the way the law existed in 2000, uh, prior to 2000. The very, it was from the very first time I taught the course and Kentucky hadn't yet adopted the new statute so I tested on the existing statute. Um, but I think all the other multiple, the short answer questions are pretty good. The first one I'm, doesn't really work very well. Uh, but the essays are fine, right? And I, and I will, after we go through it, I will post a sample answer for both of the essay questions. So you will have something to look at. But I hope that you work through them without looking at answers and then check your work because I don't know that you learn much if you just read what I wrote. I think, and that's why I didn't provide you the answer to the multi-state yet. I have posted it on Blackboard now and it will be avail available to you after class. Yay. So we, what we're gonna go over in class on that question about the bicycles, you will have the actual answer that the bar examiners wrote as the sample uh, explanation or the analysis that they were expecting the uh, examiner, not student, to use to uh, grade the exam. So we still have to finish up uh, a little bit at the end of the previous chapter, which is problem 125, I think. So, uh, and 125 is asking us to work through um, section 315. D, and the question asks whether or not you have to do anything as a secured party before August 23rd. So first, I hope you know it says August 23rd because the disposition occurs on August 2nd, right? The debtor engaged in all of the transactions on August 2nd. So they're perfected secured party they have a file financing statement that covers all business machines. And then the question is, do they need to do anything on August 23rd? So why is it August 23rd? It's because under D, if you don't fit into one of the exceptions that doesn't require any action to be taken, under D3, you have to refile with the restated description of the goods, okay? Before we go into that, 315C. Take a look at 315C you'll see that there's automatic perfection as, after a disposition of collateral, okay? So you're automatically perfected. What D is dealing with is, are you continuously perfected after 20 days? So 315, security interest continues in collateral and proceeds. And the question is, do you have to do anything to be continuously per, uh, perfected in the proceeds? Under 315C, you don't for 20 days, you're perfected automatically. But then on the 21st day, you may have to do something. And that's what problem 125 is talking about. So here, let's first look at what's the description in the financing statement. Anybody? What's the description? So let's just ask this question. Let's say they transfer business machines and in exchange they get proceeds that are business machines. Do they need to refile? I hope that's obvious, right? If the financing statement includes the proceeds in its description, then you don't need to do anything at all. You don't need to work, okay? Whether it's covered by the 20 days or not. If the financing statement covers the proceeds in its description, then you know you're fine because it's there, right? There's no, no problem. You may not have to have done anything under D1 or D2, but you don't even have to worry about D3. 
right, the 20 day rule, because you have a description that's adequate and you're good. Okay, so that's the first thing. If the financing statement covers the type of collateral that, the, that, that are the proceeds, you're fine. So that's the starting point. 315D is a little weird. It's not exactly written in the most obvious way to understand it. Before we work through the problems, what I want to do is just take two seconds to talk about D1 and D2. D1 essentially says, if the proceeds are received without any intervening cash, so it's just a barter, then you're fine. You don't need to do anything. And that means that you could have a financing statement that is inadequate to cover the collateral, but you don't need to do anything. D2 says if it's cash proceeds, you don't need to do anything. So those are the two circumstances where you don't even have to analyze whether or not the financing statement or whatever system is in place to cover the collateral. You don't have to do anything. If it's a barter type transaction under D1, you're fine. The proceeds are covered. If it's cash proceeds under D2, you're covered. D3 doesn't actually cover anything specifically. It's just if D1 and D2 don't work, then you gotta do something. But always remember, if, the if it's collateral covered by a financing statement, could be covered by a financing statement, and the proceeds would fall into the description of the financing statement, you're fine. You don't need to do anything. So if the proceeds in one of these problems were, in fact, business machines, then it would be okay. Because the financing statement would be adequate to cover. No confusion. Even if it's purchased with intervening cash, don't care. Doesn't matter. Financing statement is okay. Does that make sense? D3 is a, D, uh, 315D is a little bit confusing in how it's structured, but that's essentially where we end up. So let's just work through the problems. We have a financing statement that covers uh, all business machines, and under A, the debtor traded for another computer. Debtor traded a computer for another computer. Does the secured party need to do anything? Okay, first, it falls under D1, doesn't it? It's a trade. And second, it's a business machine. So in either case, the proceeds are covered. How about B, the debtor traded another computer for a painting to be hung in the office. Is a painting a business machine? I hope that, it could be equipment, right? The type of collateral called equipment, it could be equipment, but it's not a business machine. So this financing statement has a more narrow description of collateral than the types of collateral in Article 9. Business machines, likely are equipment, but not all equipment is a business machine. Does that make sense? Is the painting a business, business machine? Okay. Do they need to do anything? So the financing statement does not cover the kind of collateral that is proceeds here. Do they need to do anything? Yes. Okay, tell me why. Why do you think they have to do something? Um, so, and we're, get, we're looking at 315D. Um, because they didn't get cash proceeds, it was a trade. What's the lead into 315? D. If the following conditions are satisfied, there's a filing statement covered, there's a financing statement covering the original collateral. Uh -huh. um, the proceeds are collateral in which the security interest may be perfected by filing an office in which the filing statement has been filed. And the proceeds are not acquired with cash proceeds. Okay, so what happens if all those things are true? Then they're good, it's perfected. <clears throat> Is the is the perfection is the is the perfection in proceeds continuous? Yes. Yes. Okay. Does the financing statement cover paint the painting? No. Was there cash involved? No. Can you file to perfect a security interest in a painting at the same place where you file the financing statement? Yes. Yes. Okay. And was it so? There's no cash, so it was a trade. Mm -hmm. It's the same office, and you would file in the same place. We're all good? 
Do they need to do anything? No, right? Everybody see that? So as we work through 315D1, under D, you don't need to do anything else under D1 if you meet all the conditions. And the conditions are file financing statement covers the original collateral. Do we have a file financing statement? Yes. The proceeds are collateral which could be perfected by filing in the same office. Would a painting be covered by a financing statement filed in the same place? Yes. Okay. Proceeds are not acquired with cash proceeds. It was a trade. Is there any cash? <coughs> We're fine. What's the consequence of this? There is a piece of collateral owned by the debtor for which a filed financing statement does not explicitly cover it. That's the consequence. If I'm another lender and I come along and I search and I find business machines, would I automatically think that the painting was covered? No, so it essentially allows a seriously misleading financing statement to be effective, right? Because it's proceeds. That's the consequence of 315D1. We have a financing statement that says business machines, but we have collateral that is art on the wall. If I'm another lender and I search the financing statements, the, the, the Secretary of State's office, and I find this financing statement, would I find a statement that covered, explicitly covered paintings. But I'm a lender, what should I know? 315D1. If there are proceeds that fall under 315D1, they might be perfected, even though they're not described in the financing statement. That's the consequence of D1. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Okay. Everybody good with that? So this is one of those circumstances where you can have a financing statement that is technically not covered, doesn't cover the collateral, and yet it's still okay. But that's because it's proceeds. This only applies to proceeds. Special rule for proceeds. Okay, problem C, the debtor traded a duplicating machine for a used car. Does D1 apply? Why not? So where would you file to perfect a security interest in a duplicating machine? Right, because it's not a certificate of the title collateral. It would be the Secretary of State's office. The cars are a certificate of title collateral. Where do you file to perfect a security interest in certificate of title collateral? On the title, yes. So what do they have to do by August 23rd? Sorry? Yeah, but and where do they refile? Uh, they're on the title. <laughs> yeah, they need the debtor to hand them the title and then to go to the DMV and record their security interest in the car as proceeds. That's fine. No, you go ahead. After the 20 days, it become unperfected. That is right. So now what happens if you have collateral for which you become unperfected? You remember those rules? You lose priority, and for some kinds of people, it's totally retroactive, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> Who is it retroactive for? So, would you lose out to a lien creditor? Well, you were perfected for 20 days, right? Were you perfected in the collateral at all in the car, even though there was no information on the car? Yeah, you were perfected for 20 days, 9315C, the car's proceeds. Mm -hmm. So you're perfected for 20 days. Mm -hmm. If you're perfected, do you lose to the lien creditor? No. No, never. The lien creditor cannot beat the secured party in proceeds, even if it has to refile. But who could beat them? Another secured party? Yeah, a purchaser. Remember that rule? Which includes secured parties. You're retroactively unperfected. Meaning if somebody gets in there in the meantime, they have priority. 
Now you can re-perfect, but you lose your priority date. You no longer have continuous perfection. You are unperfected. And if you recall the rule, if there's any period of time where you're unperfected, you're, it's retroactive unperfection until you re-perfect. Does everybody get that? Okay. So you're unperfected on the 21st day. If you don't put, if the secured party does not record their security interest on the title, which requires them to go to the DMV because the DMV is not the Secretary of State's office. Does everybody agree with that? Secretary of State's office is not the DMV. That's the key here. Two different places where you file. D1 does not apply. Even though it's a trade, it's a barter, right? They didn't, there was no cash, but a different filing system. Yes? Um, what's like the policy kind of behind that? If because under the rule, it seems like you're already going to allow misleading financing statements, like with a painting example. I don't know. It's like these choices that have been made. They figured sophisticated lenders understand the proceeds rules, okay? And so what it says is they either have to find a financing statement that covers the collateral or ask the question, where did the collateral come from, right? Yeah. Yes? So on exam questions, should we just assume that like every car or boat or whatever is a certificated thing? Yeah, I think usually what I put is a sort of a general statement at the beginning of the exam says you may assume that okay. cars require perfection on certificates of title. If it's a boat, I, I, unless I say cars, yes, always, because that's the case. It's everywhere. It's certificate of title. But with boats, it's a little bit more nuanced. So probably I would tell you in the problem what kind of state you're in. Mm -hmm. Okay, great question. But in the practical terms, how does a uh, potentially secure party, how do you go about finding out what, uh, what things are, are proceeds from, from previous interest? Okay, so because you cannot search and find a document that helps you. Assuming you're worried about proceeds that are not covered by existing uh, 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 financing statements. So you have this all business machines kind of thing. And then you see the painting on the wall. Well, who would you ask? Yeah, exactly. You would ask the debtor. What if they don't know? What if they don't know? Who's who's so I, I think you will find that most banks don't ask. They take the risk. Yeah. It depends on how much value they, I mean, if they're nervous, they would ask. But I think in general they don't ask. They just perfect. But it, let, me, let me just say, not for this class, as a somewhat of a response to your question. You know who their lenders are. You pull a Dun & Bradstreet, which is a credit report for businesses. So you're not surprised about who their outstanding loans are to. So if you see a loan to ONB, so we're First National Bank and we see an Octopus National Bank has a loan and it has a security interest in business machines, well, we know who they've lent from, that they've got a loan from. So we're not surprised. So can you assess the risk of not asking? Yes. If ONB's loan is small, you may not care. Yeah. Um, in another textbook that I used, the authors actually uh, referred to a study they did. Um, and they asked lenders whether or not they ever asked any of these questions, and the answer was they never asked, ever. They just assumed the risk. It's too expensive to in investigate. It's just not worth it. So can they get trapped? Yes. Do they often get trapped? No. Doesn't often happen. So the key to 315 C and D is there is this opportunity for retroactive unperfection if you don't fall into the continuous perfection rules for proceeds under 315D. That's the concern, all right? So C, got to refile within 20 days. The debtor sold a calculator to a friend for cash and the same day used the cash to buy a painting to hang in the office. Do they have to re-perfect? Yes, and why? There's intervening cash. D1 doesn't apply because that applies to barters. 
D2 doesn't apply because it's not cash proceeds anymore. It's second generation proceeds, right? It's proceeds of proceeds. Our proceeds, first of all, our, what are proceeds? Proceeds are collateral. So the painting is proceeds of the cash, which is proceeds of the calculator, right? Second generation proceeds. Because there was intervening cash, do they have to refile? So, and, and what would they put in that financing statement to be perfected? Painting, yeah. To what extent do they have authority to file? The way it was described in the security agreement, or proceeds. Yes, yeah. They have authority to cover anything contained in the security agreement or proceeds thereof. So they have authority to file. They don't need permission. They're all set. 509. Okay. What if it was calculator, computer, painting? Do they need to refile? No. Calculator, computer, painting. Computer is proceeds of the calculator. Barter transaction, file in the same place, D1, continuous perfection. Painting for computer. No intervening cash, right? Are they continuously perfected under 315C? Yes. Would they file in the same place? Yes. You're fine. Okay, D. Or did we do D? We did D, right? Mm -hmm. E, the debtor sold an adding machine for $500 and put the cash in a bank account at a different bank. Let's stop right there. What kind of proceeds is that? Cash proceeds. Deposit accounts are included in the definition of cash proceeds, right? Under 9102, look up cash proceeds. Okay. The rest of the question. The bank, uh, on, on August 2nd, the bank exercised its right of set off against the account. What are they asking about here? Dip into the account and pay themselves. The depository bank has a right to set off for any loans that it has with the debtor. 9340. And you don't look, they don't have to ask for permission, they don't have to file. So the depository bank can wipe out an account to pay off an unsecured loan because they're the depository bank. So that's what this question is asking. But the, the thing that we need to know about proceeds is, is cash proceeds continuously perfected into the bank account at the other bank. Doesn't matter, don't need any kind of agreement. How do you protect yourself against the right of set off? Control. Control, and, what, and what's the best form of control to avoid set off in any fashion? <coughs> yeah, change the name on the account to the secured party. That way, they cannot exercise their right of set off under 9340. Okay? You can only perfect in a bank account by control, and the best kind of control is to have your name as the secured party be the name on the account. It's not the only way, but it is one of three ways. The debtor sold a coffee maker for $200 and gave the money to Salvation Army volunteer the same day. Can the secured party go after the two hundred dollars? <throat> no. Why not? Because of three thirty-two A, they take free of the security interest if they did not collude with. Exactly. Money, cash proceeds that are used to buy other stuff or give it to other people, take that free of the. Proceeds security interest. It goes out of the bank account or out of the wallet, free of a security interest, unless there's collusion. Unless they're trying to make it difficult for the bank to, to foreclose on the proceeds, the cash goes out free, which is a huge relief for the rest of the economy. If this rule of 332 didn't exist, right, Walmart would be getting sued by all kinds of people for the money they received for that, the purchases that those people made. Terrible. Maybe not so much Walmart because it's consumer loans, but you know, other uh, uh, retailers would be concerned about 
particularly their business customers. <coughs> but we don't have to worry about that because of 332. Okay, how do you guys feel about this? You, you good? That was the end of proceed. We have one more problem, but I just want to make sure. This question is the, uh, one of the key questions about proceeds. Do you understand how the tracing rules, the perfection, continuous perfection rules work? Bless you. Okay, question uh, 126. They ask, uh, Ericsson Motors sold a car on credit. Um, the, the, there's chattel paper here, right? The security is in the inventory and proceeds. Uh, Ericsson Motors sold a car on credit, who paid a thousand down and signed a contract obligating him to pay twenty five thousand more. The car dealership assigned the contract and promissory note the Smith signed to the Cartier Finance Company, which took possession of these items. There is this interesting rule in nine three thirty that says the chattel paper financing company has better security than the inventory lender, particularly with respect to returned goods. And that's 9330C. It just look at not comment nine. This is a very, uh, if you understand this, this is a very advanced point. I, I worry that you don't understand question 125. If you, you need to understand 125. 126, that's high level analysis under our article nine, okay? I seriously doubt that the bar exam would ever ask any question structured like 126 because that's just that's what that's tough stuff okay but the rule is basically if the stuff is returned and the dealership becomes owner again right it's proceeds now of the of the it's proceeds of the chattel paper the return item is now proceeds of the chattel paper the chattel paper financer has a higher priority in the return item and that's the what comment nine All right, before we move on, any questions about proceeds? Okay. Do you want to do the problem first, the uh, multi-state exam problem before we move on to the fall? Super. All right. Um, so we have a question. <coughs> It says, I have a question about the problem. You bet. Yes. Yeah. So are you going to give us like participation credit for that, or are you actually grading it? I'm not grading it. As long as you're submitting okay. it, and I'm going to give you the full multi-state examiner's analysis so that you can review it. We'll yeah. review it together, and then you will also have their analysis so you can compare it. All I wanted was a good faith effort. So you get 10 points if you put in the effort to, uh, to answer the question. If you got it completely wrong, but you tried, you get full credit. Okay? All right? So try not to be punitive. I'm trying to help you to figure out. And this is a question they actually asked in the bar exam in 2013. Okay. So we have a purchase of two bicycles on June 1, right? buys two bicycles from a retailer, paid $200 down payment, and also signed a security agreement, and a promissory note, right? So basically he financed $1,300. Security agreement and a loan for thirteen hundred dollars. What does that equal? Oh, we haven't gotten there yet. Not what what level is the security agreement? If you have a document, I'm just I'm asking. This is not part of the question. This is something I'm just asking. If a buyer signs a promissory note and a security agreement, what is that under Article Nine? Yes, chattel paper. Okay. Now that's not part of this question. They didn't know nobody sold the chattel paper, but that is chattel paper. 
9102. I forget the subsection. Okay? A security agreement plus a promissory note is chattel paper. Not part of this question, just I'm just asking. Okay, so somebody yelled up purchase money security interest. Excellent. Why is it purchase why is this a purchase money security interest? Why is that a purchase money security interest? So credit was extended to allow the debtor to acquire an interest in the collateral, and in fact, the money was actually used for that. So who's the secured party here? The retailer, the retailer right? So the retailer sells two bicycles. They're the secured party. So how would you describe this? If you're writing this out, the initial transaction, you need to explain. So let's work through that. How would we describe the initial transaction? 103. Sorry? I would just use the definitions from 103. Okay. Like what is purchase money collateral? What is the purchase money obligation? The okay. The the collateral, the obligation is the... It, so um, is there a security interest at all? Before you even get to whether or not it's purchase money, is there a security interest? Yes. The I wrote that up because somebody yelled it out, but you, you, there's an assumption here that in fact we have a security interest. Why do we know we have a security interest? Sorry? I don't know. No, I, just, I sounded right, so I just wanted to. Value rights in the green. Exactly, 203, right? Is there a security interest? First thing, we need a security interest. If there's no security interest, we're all, we're done, right? There's no no question. Value rights agreement under 9203. Okay. We have a signed security agreement. We have the debtor having rights in the collateral. The debtor bought the bikes. And the value is the loan. Can you repeat it? So the debtor bought the bikes, right? So that's rights in the collateral. The debtor signed a security agreement, so we have an agreement. And the retailer lent money to the buyer to buy the bikes. That's the value. So we have value rights in the agreement. So we have a security interest. All right. Do we have a perfected security interest? Yes. It's automatic. Automatic. What section tells us? This is 203. What tells us that it's automatic? Perfection. Um, okay, 9309, and it's subsection one. one. It's the very first one. Subsection one says a purchase money security interest in consumer goods is automatically perfected upon attachment, right? So, is this purchase money? We already did that analysis, right? But it is. What tells us what is purchase money? 9103, right? Mm -hmm. So, purchase money, security interest, automatic perfection. So, do we have a perfected secured party? Okay. You cannot answer the rest of the question until you've done this. But you can, you will not get full credit for this problem if you do not do this analysis. So you did not tell us this is a perfected security interest. It said retailer sold the bikes on credit, got a security agreement, debtor walked away, and that's all the problem said. It did not say this is a perfected security interest. So you have to do the analysis. Yes? You just answered my question. Oh, okay. Yeah. If, if an examiner doesn't want you to talk about something in this area, they'll say retailer has a perfected security interest in the bikes. Don't spend one second talking about it. You're done. They've given you the answer. They did not in this problem. So therefore, we have to do this now. Okay. First part of the problem. Figure out if you have a perfected security interest. If it's not a perfected security interest, that's an interesting consequence, right? I mean, you need to know that this is perfected under 9309, because if it's not perfected, who's the person 
in the first example. What happens to the first bike? It's purchased. Sorry? It's purchased. It's bu there's a buyer, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a buyer. And so now the question is, does the buyer take free or subject to? Well, we got to look. Which rule tells us whether or not there, we, uh, what is the section that tells us that we have to worry about whether or not the security interest continues? Nine three fifteen A one, right? Nine three fifteen A one says a security interest in goods continues notwithstanding the disposition of the collateral unless there's some other reason for it not to be, not to continue. Nine three seventeen B. What does that section tell us? You can flip to it if you want. Could the guy who bought the bicycle take free of the security interest? Can he claim first that he's a buyer that's protected by 9317B? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He gave value and he received delivery. Okay, but can he, is he protected against the retailer under 9317B? Nine three seventeen B, not nine uh, three twenty four B. What does except as otherwise section E, which is a purchase money security interest? Okay, but is he a purchase money buyer? Is this a purchase money sale for him? No. Who's he buying it from? Right. Yeah, well, and we haven't gotten to the garage sale exception yet. But is this is this a buyer in the ordinary course nine three twenty four A situation? No. Does not apply, right? The owner of the bicycle is not a seller of bicycles. He's not in the business of selling bicycles. So it can't be a buyer in the ordinary course. So 9324A doesn't apply. Does 9317B apply? Does, does 9317B cut off the retailer's security interest? Why not? Oh, you said yes. It's perfected. It was perfected. perfected. So does nine three seventeen B work? No. So we have a perfected security interest. We can't use nine three seventeen B. We don't have a buyer in the ordinary course, so we can't use nine three twenty four A. What's another one? Okay. And what is this one called? So Did I get something wrong? 320. 320. Sorry, 320. Yeah, and then that's the garage sale. Thank you. Right? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm doing this without a net, and that's stupid. I should never do that. I told you, everybody should have the book open whenever they're doing this. That's why I make this an open book exam, uh, open code exam, because that's how real lawyers actually do it. Is it a buyer in the ordinary course on the 328? No. Is a, what's 9320B? Garage sale. Is this a garage sale exception? What do you need for it to be a garage sale exception? Well, let's start here. What has to be true about the seller? Yeah. So we need a consumer seller, right? Mm -hmm. What else do we need? Consumer buyer. Is the buyer buying for personal use? Yes. I'm sorry, I skipped over that, didn't I? We didn't ask the question, was this a consumer good? Is it a consumer good in the first instance? Yeah. Yep. Yes, why did he, why did the original buyer buy the two bicycles? For vacation? Yeah, yeah. that personal, family, or household use? Yeah. Okay, so it's consumer goods. So do we have a consumer seller? Mm -hmm. Personal use, do we have a consumer buyer? Why is the buyer in the second, why is the, that, Buy, the second buyer buying here. Birthday. So it says birthday? What is it? Sold one of the bicycles at a garage sale to a buyer who paid the man $400 for the buyer bought the bicycle to ride for weekend recreation. Is yep. that personal, family, or household use? Yes. Okay. And what else do we need in order for the garage sale exception to exist? The Sorry? Without knowledge of the interest. Sorry. Is, it, what, is that what it says? Yeah. Yes. Without knowledge of the interest. Without knowledge of the security interest. 
and no knowledge. And what was the last one? No financing statement. No filed financing <coughs> statement. Great. Does the buyer in this case meet all of these requirements? Yes. yes. Does this buyer take free of retailer security interest? Yes. Terrific. Okay. Yes. Would you repeat again why 9317B is on? So 9317B protects the buyer, a good faith purchaser, a bona fide purchaser for value who takes from, uh, uh, who buys the products when the secure party is unperfected. Was the retailer unperfected? No. No, because it's a purchase money security interest in consumer goods and that's automatically perfected under 3091. You don't need to file a final statement. So immediately upon attachment, the security interest is perfected <coughs> under 9, uh, um, under 93091. No financing statement necessary. So therefore they are perfected. 317B doesn't work. 317B doesn't ask, was there a financing statement? It asks, was the secured party unperfected? And so that's the difference. Yeah? Um, in our analysis for the final, do we need to go through why 9317B doesn't apply? Why you know, it's interesting. The bar examiners actually wrote it out. It's in their analysis. What they're, and, and I think what they're getting at is the default rule is the security interest continues unless there's a reason why it doesn't. And so they want you to explain how you got to the analysis that it didn't. Now, would they give you full credit if you jumped right to, nine, not right to 9320B? I bet they would. Because I don't have any other facts to make me think otherwise. I mean, they said garage sale. So hopefully that goes, oh, the garage sale exception, right? Yeah. So they kind of set people up to just go right to the garage. I was just, I wanted to be more complete. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they would have given full points. Because the question wasn't explain how they wouldn't otherwise be. It was, are they? And the question is, yeah, they take free because of 9320B. So you would get full points. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the question is, is there a way to get there, to, to cut off the security interest? And the answer is yes. There's one way to do it. So right. Yeah. But they did, it's interesting, they did mention it in the analysis. So I, I wonder if that means they were looking for it, but it, yeah. there's nothing in here to suggest that it's an unperfected security interest, so why would you even go to that? I just bring it up because they brought it up. Yeah, the garage sale exception qualifies in that exception under Exactly. Okay. That's exactly, the, that's exactly the analysis. First, you have to decide, is it a perfected security interest? Mm -hmm. Right? Yes, under 93091, it's a perfected security interest because it's, there's, a, there's an attachment and it's automatic under 93091, okay? So it's a perfected security interest. 9315 says it continues unless, and the unless here is 9320B. And I'm sorry, I said 324B, yeah. This is why you have the code open. Now, I'm not asking you for correct citations. I'm asking you to write the law correctly. So you can say 9324, and if you don't explain the law, you don't get very many points. If you explain the law and forgot to put 9324, 9320B on it, fine. You've gotten, if you get the law right, you get the law right. That's what I care about. Okay. Sometimes it's helpful, I think, just to, oh yeah, 320B is the garage sale. I'm looking for you to explain the law. Okay, second person who got the bicycle. Is the second person a purchaser? So none of the analysis we've done here works because there's no buyer. Are there other exceptions that would cover a donee? Have we looked at the donee exception from security interest? <clears throat> there's nothing in Article 9 that protects the second recipient of the bike from the security interest. So what's the answer? How do we, so what, at the end of the day, what sections would you look at to answer the second bicycle? 9315. Yeah, 9315A1. 
Security interest continues in the bicycle, notwithstanding the disposition. Now, it is a disposition, right? There's a new owner. That security interest still exists. That new owner is now a debtor, by the way, because the owner is the debtor, not the obligor. Okay. <clears throat> yes? Uh, just so, for purposes of like structuring on your exam and for the bar, um, would we, like after finishing A, when we go to part B, talking about uh, the government, would we need to rerun through everything we went through, like the, all the analysis? Well, but none of this applies, okay. because he's not a professor, he's not a buyer. He didn't buy, he received as a gift. Gift, Domi is not. I, uh, none of those cover donees, they only cover buyers. So you just say there is no exception that covers a donee of an of a piece of buyer. So therefore the security interest will Yes. So, uh, do you mean like the intro part? Like do we have to go? No, no, but the intro part applies. It, it, to both answers? Yeah, it would apply to both answers. Okay. Yeah. I wouldn't expect you to write that out twice. You're answering the question, <clears throat> does the first buyer or the, or the second recipient have take free of the security interest. Well, first you have to decide there's a security interest. And that applies to both. So I would not ask you to write that twice, and I don't think the bar examiners would either. Right? They just want to see that you can do the analysis. Okay. Yeah. You can, and you know, I know with exam four, cut and paste, you would probably do that. You're not going to get extra credit, because it's only one analysis. Yes. So the buyer could go to the retailer and say, I'd like to give the bike away, and I want to give it away without your security interest. But none of, that did not happen. So therefore, the security interest continues. So there's no facts that suggest the secured party authorized the disposition free of the security interest. Good. Excellent point. Should we run through each exception, or can you just say they're not a purchaser? In the second one, he's not a buyer. Or that's, yeah. Yeah. So. And there is no exception that applies to somebody who's not a buyer. So every exception. Well, yeah, yeah, and that's fine. Um, you, none of the ones that we've looked at apply. Mm -hmm. So you can just say, you know, for me, I would just hope that you would just say, the exceptions, right, 9315 also applies in this circumstance because the transfer is still a disposition, right? So 9315 D1, uh, sorry, A1 still applies. So I still have to do that. Just because you give it away doesn't mean 315 doesn't apply. The transfer is a disposition. Somebody else is now the owner. However, there are no exceptions that allow for the transfer of a security interest for, uh, to a, a donee, for lack of a better word, without the security interest. Um, I think it's right, you would probably want to mention, the only way to get it is to ask for permission, right? Under 9315A. If it's authorized, it's cool. But there's nothing in the facts that suggests this was authorized. Um, I don't know, this might not make sense, but what if the guy who bought it from the garage sale gifted it to a friend? Does he have to get authorization from a, a retailer to dispose of the product? So that's a great question. Is there security interest after he buys from the garage sale? No. There's no security interest, so no. So any subsequent transfers are irrelevant because the secured party is cut off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a great question. They don't reappear. Once, they're, once the security interest is severed, it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So could the, could the secured party get the proceeds in the bike? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's the blob. It, it can attach to multiple things at the same time. So the uh, secured party, the reseller, will have access to the $400 that the buyer, the original buyer, received, and also will have the right to foreclose on the bike. Yeah. Will they? I don't know. Right? Consumer goods lose value so quickly, it's highly unlikely they will, but they do have a theoretical security interest. And I will tell you, I'm sure eBay is riddled with these things. Right? <laughs> Unless you can make an argument that the seller is a consumer seller, when you're buying from a vendor, uh, 
<laughs> you have no idea what security interests are in that collateral. It's, there are probably hundreds of thousands of sales weekly on eBay that are where the security interest has not gone away because they're not from it's not a consumer sale. It's not you, the 320B doesn't have one. Does it? Do people foreclose that? No. I mean, what, I mean it's, it's hard to track the collateral down. That's the problem. You got to know where it is and then go get it. Yeah. I have a really stupid question. Um, so, I know the garage sale exception applies to like garage sales, but would it also apply if you like sold it on eBay? Yes, okay. it absolutely would. It's, it's colloquially referred to as the garage sale exception, but it does not have to be a garage sale. You just have to meet the test. Consumer seller to consumer buyer who has no knowledge, pays value, and there is no file finance extension. Yeah, that's what I the actual <laughs> marketplace is irrelevant. Okay. Yeah. Just making sure. They just they call it the garage sale exception because that's the kind of example that's easy to explain. But yeah, eBay would work for consumer sellers. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. What I was saying is like there's a lot of people who run eBay businesses and they acquire stuff from people, but they're not they don't have one of these protections. Yeah, I was just making sure yeah. so I didn't make like a dumb mistake on it. No, 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 that's exactly right. It's a great question. <laughs> if it was eBay, it would count too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have a question. Sure. Kelsey and I. But she wanted to ask. <laughs> so if you, um, would this apply like in one of those flea marketplaces where you rent a booth? Or would you be a vendor if you rented a booth? Yeah, if you rent a booth and it's, so. But it's like garage sale stuff, like in your house, but you still rented a booth. So. I would say that if it's your stuff, you're okay. It's when you sell other people's stuff. I don't think the marketplace matters because you essentially a flea market is eBay, right? Just it's not where you sell it that matters. It's how you're selling. You're a consumer seller of consumer goods to a consumer buyer who has no knowledge of the existence of the security interest. There's no file financing statement, and the buyer gives value. Yeah. So yeah, that would be fine. But most of the people who are selling in a flea market are not selling their own stuff, right? They, they, in the sense of they are not the party that acquired it. Yeah. They're a business, they buy from people, and then they're selling it. Like an antique shop, not a garage sale. Yeah. Is that good? All right, we don't have a whole lot of time. We have 15 minutes. All right, and I understand many of you are taking, how many of you are, of you are taking the MPRE? Great, okay, so forget Friday. That would be a complete waste of time. Um, but we will meet the following Friday and then I'll find another time after that for us to get together, okay? <coughs> the, the material for today is about essentially default and repossession. The first thing I want you to do is open to section 601. Take a look at 9601. And in particular, 9601A. So the way 9601 works is it says, after default, the secured party has the rights provided in this part and except as otherwise provided in 602, those provided in the agreement of the parties. First thing it said, right? So when they say this part, they mean part six, which is default repossession. Okay. In addition, you may also, under part one, reduce a claim to judgment, foreclose, or otherwise enforce the claim, security, interest, or agricultural lien by any available judicial procedure. <clears throat> What does this say? What does that mean? It means you can choose to either do the form of repossession and foreclosure provided under Article 9, or you can proceed under the common law rules or other rules provided for in another statute for foreclosure and sale. There are no limitations on how the secured party is allowed to get their get paid. So part six is the part where they get paid. This is where the debt, uh, sorry, the secured party is getting paid. They can get paid either by proceeding under Article 9 or under 601A, subpart one, by going to court and getting a judgment. 
And I want to distinguish between these two. Article 9 sets up a, an extrajudicial way to foreclose. You don't have to go to court, prove your debt, get a judgment, and then foreclose under the system. You can, but you don't have to. All right. We're not going to get to this today. At the next class, I'm going to start off with, and you remind me if I don't do this, we're going to watch a video of lizard lick towing. One of the funniest, stupidest reality TV shows ever made. I mean, just outright dumb. But it is such a wonderful uh, uh, learning tool for this class because what they are doing on that show is Article 9 repossession. When the repo man goes to get the car, that's an Article 9 non-judicial foreclosure. That's the first sentence of 9601A. What lets them do this? 9609. So if we flip to 9609, 9609 is the method by which a secured party may take possession through either a non-judicial or judicial process. So 9609A, after default, the secured party may take possession of the collateral or render it unusable. That's A. B, secured party may proceed under subsection A either pursuant to a judicial process or without judicial process if, the proceeds, uh, if it proceeds without breach of the peace. Now it's that last part that Lizard Lick is just it's great. 9609 B1 is not the same as judgment. So, is a car easy to repossess? Yes. They often sit on the street or in a driveway. The repo man can go and take it at night. <coughs> Drive away, 9609B2, uh, without any help from any court, just take the car. It's not limited to cars. It's any collateral that they can get this way. But it's particular cars, okay? But what if it's not a car? What if it's all of the merchandise in a store? How do you get it? without actually doing the formal foreclosure proceeding. You do replevin. Replevin is a writ that you can ask for possession. And in fact, technically what replevin is, is somebody else has my stuff and I want it back. That's what replevin is. The secured party is saying, that's my stuff and I want it back. And courts absolutely allow that. And I will put up today a, uh, a recording where I explain this in a little bit more detail. But that's not judgment. That is merely a writ of possession. It's a judicial procedure, but it doesn't require proof of a claim. You don't have to sue for a debt and prove that the debt is owed. And then after judgment, in fact, all you do is you go to court and you say, They've got my stuff. The court's probably going to ask, prove that. And you go, well, here's the security agreement, and they're in breach. And the court will go, cool, writ of replevin. And a writ of replevin can be executed by a sheriff. And all they have to do is show up and take the stuff. That's all they have to do. Okay? So I just want to make sure we understand the structure of how 9601 and 609 work. 601 says I can sue, get a judgment, and do all the standard stuff, or I can do Article 9. And Article 9 is much, much better. And is all this like outside of the bankruptcy context? Yes. You can't do any of this when the automatic stay is in place. Good question in the back? Sorry. Oh, okay, yeah. All right. So, none of it can occur before default. So the first part the first part of this chapter is like, what are the standards for when you have possession of stuff? 9207. 
you got to take care of the stuff. You can't let it, you know, you can't be negligent with respect to the stuff that you either have possession of as security or you get possession of through foreclosure, through repossession. Okay, 9207. That's the first part of this chapter. You don't have to take great care of it. You just can't be negligent. That's essentially the standard that the first part says. So if it drops in value, eh, not your fault. You don't have to sell it. You don't have to do anything with it. You can take possession and hold it. As long as you don't abuse it, you're probably okay. Now, the second part is, when can you get possession? After default. And that is written all over the place in part nine. Default is not defined, as I said in the lecture, um, is not defined in Article 9. So we go to the case book, starting on page 339. They have this great case in here. So the first case, oh, let me pull my notes out here. So 127 and 128, the key is 9207 says you've got to take care of it, but not a whole lot. Uh, State Bank of Piper says the gateway to repossession is default. You cannot do anything without default. But you don't have to pick and choose. It's not the case that you only get one remedy. You get as many remedies as you want, and they're cumulative. So you can sue them to get possession of the equipment in store number one. Go get the stuff, leave. You can then go get the car that's sitting on the street. That's cool. Then you can get a judgment in a court. That's cool. You can do all of these things. You're not limited. Race judicata does not apply here. You can go back as often as you need to to get paid off. So long as there's a default and so long as you have a security interest, right? You can't foreclose if you don't have a security Okay, problem 129 is asking a simple question, are these things default? And I don't want to spend a whole lot of time about this. It, it's, it, it's good to know default is not defined in Article 9, but what it is is defined in the common law, and I'm not expecting you to have a whole lot of understanding about it. What I want to, the point I want to make here is, if you screw this up, you're stealing. It's conversion. If it's not a default, you can't get the stuff. You don't have a right to sell the stuff. You don't have a right to repossession. It all hinges on default. So where do we define default? Well, in your contract class, you, con you talked about a concept called breach. If there's no clause in the contract, in the security agreement, that defines default, Breach is probably, default is probably only non-payment. But the parties can define default as almost anything. And this is when you get into a situation where you have somebody who is making their monthly payments and they still get foreclosed on. They're not late. They haven't missed a payment. They're still a great borrower and they still get foreclosed on. So for example, you might have financial obligations in the security agreement that says you will maintain so much money in the bank account. Go below the, the number, they foreclose. You promise that the value of the collateral will always be a million dollars. Collateral turns out to be worth $900,000, you're still paying, they foreclose. It's what we call a technical default. And every security agreement has it, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you agree to it, you're subject to it. So that's what the problem 9, 129 is talking about. So a very bad financial quarter for Nervous Motors. Nervous Motors is a secured partner. No, that's not a default. The fact that the lender's business sucks is not a default. The buyer hasn't done anything wrong, probably. A very serious drop in the state of the economy. I find it hard to imagine that a, a court would uphold that as a uh, an event of default. <coughs> They've been talking to a lawyer. Yeah, I, I'm uncomfortable with that one too. A report 
that the bankruptcies, the, the debtors, have failed to pay their grocery bill for the last two months. That's called a cross-default provision. You, you fail to pay something else, you're in default under this agreement. You may be paying on time, you're still in default. Okay, I, I'm not gonna go into, I'm not gonna write a question where we're, it's sort of difficult to figure out whether the default has occurred. I, uh, doesn't, that's not interesting to me. But you should know it, right? It's not defined in Article 9, it's defined by the contract there will be terms, right? So, um, if I'm gonna ask you to do this analysis, I will make the, 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 the statement of what is a default clear, and I'll try to make the facts clear that a default has occurred, if I'm asking you to do that. So the Klingbeil case is, when does uh, default occur? Right, um, the, the one thing that, I, I, the only area where I think there's some real concern on default is an insecurity clause. So an insecurity clause is, I can call a default whenever I'm deemed insecure. And insecurity is kind of, ah, it's nebulous. What does it mean? Article 9 looks to Article 1 and defines it as a good faith belief that the likelihood of payment has gone down, has been impaired, is the language of Article 9. So there's a good faith um, provision for insecurity clauses. All right, we have one minute. I just want to start with the uh, repossession and sale. So the, this is a, the, the uh, case on uh, page 349, Smith versus AFS. Um, when we come back, the very first thing we're going to do is look at a video from Lizard Lick Towing, and that's this case. All right, and we have to decide what is a breach of the peace. Because you're allowed to repossess, but you can't breach the peace. Okay? And we'll start there. And I think we should be able to get through the rest of this stuff next Wednesday, but I'm also going to have class on the on next Friday. Nothing this week, but next Friday. Okay? Thank you. I'm sorry for the delay on stuff. I'm going to try and get myself all caught up so you guys are all set to go. Um, and then um, I will, you want, I've posted, you can go on now on the blackboard and pull down the sample answer. From the, from the multi-state bar examiners on this, and you can see the analysis there. And if you were at all confused about it. Okay. And I have sample answers for the exam, but I figured let's go through it first, and I'll make it available to you so that you can get back to the review.